Although not the largest or most impressive of shipwrecks, HMAS Sydney is one of the most important discoveries of the modern age. Her sinking had long been a mystery, with little information or details, and what little there was came from the German crew that sent her to the bottom, leaving the ultimate fate of the cruiser unknown. Until the discovery of her wreck cleared up a lot of lingering questions about her sinking. Battle damage could be identified, and a course of events put together between that and the German reports. With that in mind, I will briefly cover her sinking, as is tradition. During the afternoon of November 19th, 1941, HMAS Sydney was patrolling off the west coast of Australia. During this process, she came upon a lone merchant ship. The captain of the cruiser drew in too close, attempting to identify the merchant. This allowed the German raider, Cormoran, to get the drop on Sydney. 15 centimeter gunfire and a single torpedo slammed into the cruiser. Her return fire would cripple and eventually sink Cormoran in turn, but Sydney was doomed. The last anyone saw of her, she was drifting away with fires raging along her hull. At that point, Sydney vanished from history. Until her wreck was discovered in 2008, at a depth of 2,648 meters, or 8,097 feet. An American shipwreck hunter, David Mearns, found her and her final enemy after a long and hard search. Cormoran was found first on March 12, 2008. I will, in a later video, cover her wreck as well. As for Sydney, she was found five days later, on March 17th, based on German reports of her sailing off after the battle, or drifting off, as the case may be. The wreck that the search team found was in about the kind of shape you'd expect after the damage Sydney took. She was in pieces, with her main hull 500 meters away from her bow, resting upright on the bottom. Her bow, for its part, broke off as she sank, right around where the torpedo had hit her. Technical issues and bad weather delayed an ROV survey until April of 2008, but the pictures they brought back are enlightening in a lot of ways. A quick note in that regard. Most of these pictures will come from either the Australian Navy website, the Australian War Memorial, or the HMAS Sydney Memorial, all three of which will be linked in the description if you want to see more pictures. That aside, let's begin by looking at her weaponry, as these are some of the most striking images of Sydney's wreck, beginning with one of the most haunting images of a sunken turret that I've ever seen. This picture is of her B turret, or Sydney's forward superfiring turret. Here you can see the battle damage quite clearly, a very distinctive shell hole from Cormoran's 15 centimeter guns right through the face of the turret. I don't think I need to describe what a direct, penetrating hit like that would do to the crew inside. Further damage can be seen on the barbette, where corrosion is wearing away the paint. In fact, the worst wear on the paint is wherever damage was inflicted, which is a common thing on shipwrecks. The relative greater amount of rust on the superstructure beneath the turret is likely a result of fire damage. Sydney was burning fiercely when she was last seen, and that would have worn away the protective paint layer. The next shot shows a higher angle, which is interesting for two reasons. First, it gives a better view of the guns themselves. The previous picture had shown increased corrosion on the guns, though not from a very good angle. It was clearly rusty, but not much was evident beyond that. In this image, you can more clearly see marine growth growing on the barrels. The front of one barrel, in particular, is heavily encrusted, with some sort of animal barely in frame on the other barrel. Even at Sydney's depth, ocean life will still colonize a ship, if not quite as much as on a shallower wreck. As far as battle damage is concerned, if you look at the top of the picture, you can see half of the turret roof missing, as well as the open siding ports, though this might have been the gun operating on local control. The third image of B turret, on the other hand, is focused entirely on that damage. This shot is taken from above the turret, 
and shows a view inside. Leaving aside that this is an incredibly rare view on any wreck, it's interesting to see how little internal damage there really is. Silt and marine life are filling the turret up, but most of the internal mechanism is still visible. It's hard to make out details, mind you, but it also isn't a bunch of mud covering everything up. I wouldn't normally put this much focus on an individual turret, but Sydney's wreck and her turrets are a bit special, considering how little other evidence there is of her sinking. That said, the final image of B turret I'll share is a quick look at the rear of the turret. Here you can see an open door and another angle on the broken turret roof. It's notable that only one opening is seen here, with the other one firmly shut. This is either battle damage or the turret crew attempting to escape. Considering everything else, I'd lean towards battle damage, but it's impossible to say for sure. Moving on from that, we come to A turret, the foremost guns on Sydney. This turret is in decidedly less good shape, by which I mean it is mostly destroyed. The guns are still in place, as is the bottom of the turret and the turret face. Beyond that, however, there's almost nothing left. One entire side of the turret, along with the back, is flat out gone. The other side of the turret is still present, but bent out at a wide angle. Whatever destroyed a turret did a very, very thorough job of it. To the point it's easy to miss the metal resting on the gun barrels, just because the eye is drawn to the battle damage. The next image doesn't help there, because it's a zoomed in one on the guns themselves. In a stark contrast to B turret, there's not much left here other than the gun breaches. While this shot is an admittedly good look at a British 6 inch gun, rust aside, there's not much else to see here. As such, we'll move on to the stern of the wreck and to X turret. This is the aft super firing turret and is in better shape compared to the bow mounts. Far better shape, actually. There's no visible damage to the turret face here, although the siding ports are open once again. Furthermore, this turret is trained as far forward as it can go, with the barrels right up on the aft superstructure. This does indicate, in concert with Cormoran survivor testimony, that the turret was operating on local control and continuing to fire for as long as the gun crew could bring it to bear. There are, however, fairly few good quality images of this turret. A shame considering this is the gun, and crew, that crippled Cormoran. As for damage to the turret, the only image I've been able to find is one of the rear of the turret. Here there is a small shell hole on the right side, towards the back. It appears that the back of the gun house is open, again, with the location of that shell hit, it might have been blown open. Or, on the other hand, this is one of the last areas still fighting against the German Raider. So the crew might have survived long enough to evacuate the turret, but again, we'll never know. That leaves her Y turret, the aftmost guns. These guns also survived long enough to fire on Cormoran, but from reports, only X turret managed to land any hits. Y turret unfortunately missed. In the modern day then, Y turret has some of the grainier pictures. Not to say they aren't interesting, but the pictures aren't as high quality. The most interesting thing here is what's stuck on top of the turret. This tangled mess of debris is the remnants of one of Sydney's funnels. Presumably this was torn off during the sinking and came to rest atop the turret. This shows both a harsh sinking and how it destroyed this funnel, but also a relatively gentle fall to the seabed to keep that aboard the ship. This debris has almost completely obscured Y turret, though the open siding ports are still visible, as is the fact that one of the guns has fallen in its mounting, though if this is from battle damage or from the funnel, isn't immediately clear. The final image of this turret shows it angled forward, just like X turret, which isn't a surprise. Not only were these the last weapons to fire on Cormoran, but they were evidently jammed in place, which prevented them from firing as Sydney drifted away from the German Raider. With Sydney's main battery done, I'll briefly look at her other weaponry, her 4-inch guns and her torpedo tubes. 
These will go quicker, as there is less to talk about here. First, the 4-inch guns. Sydney carried four of these, two on either side of the ship, for anti-aircraft and secondary weapon duty. On her wreck today, these continue to point in various directions. From what I found on Sydney's final battle, these either didn't engage Cormoran or fired without effect. Not a surprise, as Cormoran's light weaponry raked Sydney up and down and would have gunned down the exposed gun crews. The guns themselves are in fairly decent shape in light of that fact. Russ has begun to overtake the barrels, along with the first bits of marine life, but they're still recognizable for what they were, at least for the most part. The foremost gun on the port side, P1, shows much more severe damage around it, including part of the mounts bent up and over the gun. P2, the second port side gun, is in better shape. The more interesting thing here is the ready ammunition locker lying beside it. No visible ammunition is inside the openings, but one can easily imagine that the closed ports still have their shells inside. Sadly, the starboard guns are in far worse condition. S1 detached from Sydney as the cruiser sank and ended up in the debris field. All that's left on the wreck today is the base of the gun mounting which, I suppose, does make for an interesting look at the base of one of these mounts. S2, on the other hand, remains aboard the ship. The distinct feature of this mount, other than the intact railing on the side, is part of a gun shield. This was attached in 1940 to provide some protection to the gun crews. On the other mounts, this is completely gone. Even on S2, there's only a small portion left, right beneath the gun barrel itself. With that, though, all that's left are the torpedo tubes. Much like gun S1, these fell away as Sydney sank, leaving nothing but the training gear left aboard the cruiser. Here you can see the starboard mount, or what's left of it. And here is the port side gear, though the image doesn't show it in as much detail. The torpedo mounts themselves ended up inverted in the debris field. The Australian Navy website, where these images came from, lists this as the starboard mount. It is notably missing two torpedoes, with no sign of them remaining. I would presume these were fired at Cormoran, in the chaos of the battle, because the port mount, as listed by the Navy, is only missing one torpedo. And as seen here, two of the remaining torpedoes on the port mount show clear signs of damage. This does imply that up to three torpedoes were fired by the cruiser, at least looking at the tubes on the bottom. In the chaos of that battle, it is tough to say. Regardless, I'll finish up the torpedo tubes with two more pictures of the port mounts. First, a look at the rear of the tubes. In contrast to the damaged torpedoes, this shows almost no damage or deterioration. It's remarkably intact, actually, and not even buried in the bottom, which allows for the final image to be visible of a brass plaque on the back of the mount. While the image isn't the best for reading, the writing is still legible. This never stops being impressive, no matter which wreck you're looking at. However, that does finish off the look at Sydney's weaponry. This was a lot longer than it normally would be, but in comparison to other wrecks, there was a lot more to talk about here. By contrast, there is less to talk about with the hull, because the weaponry took up most of the attention of the expeditions. Let's begin with her bow. As I said before, this detached from the rest of the hull as Sydney sank, most likely broken off by the torpedo damage from Cormoran. While the main hull of the cruiser ended up upright on the bottom, the bow inverted as it sank. This is easily visible here, looking at it from the front. Both of the anchors are firmly mounted in place, albeit upside down. It's actually almost as impressive an image as the first shot of B turret, simply because of how intact the bow is from this angle. While upside down, it looks like the ship is still sailing forward. It makes for an interesting contrast to this shot of the bow from when Sydney was afloat and in one piece. 
Unfortunately, the rear of the bow is not in such fine condition. Here, where the hull broke, the metal is torn and twisted. I'm not sure which side of the bow this is, as the source doesn't say, but it's clear that the bow was torn off. No clean splits to be found here. The next image moves away from the bow and to her bridge. There's only one shot of this I've found, seen here, which is a bit blurry. That blurriness does little to disguise the severe damage to the bridge, however. This is one of the first areas hit by Cormoran, likely contributing to Sydney's slow reaction to the attack. That said, the damage here is probably not from gunfire. Towards the top of the picture, you can see where most of the bridge screen was crushed in. Moreover, the compass platform is flat out gone. The Australian Navy's website notes some speculation in regards to this damage. Specifically that Sydney's bow, as it broke away in the sinking, struck the forward part of the bridge and crushed it. I can only imagine the force of that impact if that was the case. Unfortunately, I'm not lying when I say there is little in the way of pictures for this area of the ship. This next picture is a look at the base of her director control tower, which does at least show evidence of the gunfire that wrecked the bridge. The actual director itself is in the debris field, and I'll look at that towards the end. Before that though, let's look at the other images of the hull. Next in line, we have a shot of her deck near the bakery. What's impressive about this shot is less the hull itself, and more the deck. While deep water wrecks having intact wood isn't uncommon, Sydney's is remarkable in its preservation. It looks like you could walk along the cruiser's deck, like her crew did in happier times, if it weren't at a depth that would crush you flat. The bakery itself is admittedly less interesting. While the structure is intact and recognizable, it isn't a critical part of the ship. The most interesting part of it, to me at least, is that this is a piece of life aboard a ship that isn't often seen. When a wreck is dived, especially a deep wreck, areas like this aren't often focused on. Even on Sydney, that's true, when you look at how much attention the weapons got compared to the hull. But the bakery is definitely not something you see often. This shot here is a more distant look at it. The doorway inside is open, although full of debris. The ladder next to it, meanwhile, is completely intact and in place, despite moving a bit further aft where a shell hole is visible in the structure. Even here, Cormoran's firepower is evident. However, as we move further aft, the pictures thin out even more. There are four features left to look at on the hull itself. Her aircraft crane, her quarter deck, and her propellers. As well as an image of battle damage, though I'm unsure of where this is on the wreck. First, we have the crane. This is fairly intact, although damage is visible in this first image here. Further damage to the crane can be seen in this follow-up image. A tangled mess resting on the deck of the cruiser. This shot here of the crane in action shows a good look at what it once was. The last image of this area is notable mostly for another shell hole visible towards the bottom of the image. This looks smaller, so it may have come from one of Cormoran's lighter weapons. It's difficult to make out for sure, however. With that out of the way, though, I'll show two images of her quarter deck to round out Sydney's upper hull. This area of the cruiser imploded as she sank, which makes it likely it had air inside as the rest of the ship pulled in under. That may not be immediately apparent, but when you compare this image to a look at the quarter deck on the surface, it becomes much more obvious. The deck has collapsed, with the side angled up over the center. The final image of the hull itself shows this better. Here you can see the extreme aft of the cruiser, tilted at an angle with some crushing visible at the bottom of the image. It doesn't make for a pretty sight, even though it shows more of the wooden decking still intact. Before I move on to her propeller, or screw depending on what you call it, we have this image of battle damage. As I said, I don't know where this is on the hull. The source doesn't say. 
This is mostly notable because it shows where Cormoran shells fail to penetrate, leaving dents in the hull. It also shows how battle damage degrades paint, which leads to faster rusting. However, with nothing else to note here, that leaves the propeller. This is buried in the mud, with some of the shaft visible directly ahead of it. It's difficult to make out much more of the hull past that, as the image gets blurry. So, with that in mind, I'm not going to stick around here. It's a fairly intact screw, which is always interesting to see, but it also isn't that different from other wrecks. The debris field, on the other hand, very much is. So let's move on to that. As this video is already very long, I'm not going to go over every piece of debris. The links I give in the description will have more images if you want to see some of these smaller bits. For the purposes of wrapping this up, I'll limit this to three pieces. First, we have the director control tower, seen here when it was still on the ship, and seen here in the debris field. This is, similar to the bow, inverted on the bottom. Open doorways are visible, likely forced open as it was torn from the ship. This probably happened as the ship sank, either from an impact by the bow or from simple water pressure. Either way, it's one of the larger pieces in the debris field. Rust streaks are overtaking it, which I would put down to fire damage, considering how much Sydney burnt towards her bow. And yet, even with that rusting, open doorways are visible, as well as ladders. The next piece of debris, the aft funnel, is similarly intact. The thin metal hasn't rusted away, or even collapsed, which is uncommon even on other deep shipwrecks. In fact, while it has fallen away from the ship, the aft funnel is pretty much intact, at least in this image. Even the stovepipes remain in place, and I can't think of any other wreck like that off the top of my head. However, as we reach the end of the video, the really impressive preservation arrives. These are Sydney's boats, her very wooden boats. It's one thing to have her deck planking intact. That isn't unique, though it is rare. But I truly can't think of any other shipwreck, deep water or shallow, with such intact boats. The wood is clearly deteriorating, yes, but the boats are still there. These are normally one of the first things to go, as the wood is eaten away. On Sydney, several of the boats remain, in varying degrees of preservation. The first one, one of her 35-foot motor boats, still has the exterior planking. Even the crest, with its intact paint, remains firmly in place. I know I'm repeating myself here, but that's incredibly impressive. This next image shows two further boats resting atop each other. These aren't quite as nice, with the exterior planking rotted away. But the frame of the boat remains intact, including another crest. It is, in a way, another reminder of the human cost of this sinking. These boats could have saved some of the crew in a less chaotic sinking. However, it is entirely likely they were burnt and otherwise damaged. Clearly, they were never launched. They probably fell away as the ship sank. Coming to rest on the bottom, a forlorn reminder of how none of Sydney's crew found safety, or rescue. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.